honored to have you all with us this evening. Please know we have an overflow room, the fireside room. If you walk down this way, the last room on your right has additional seating and a television monitor in there. Um, before we get started with our candidates forum, we would ask you all to stand and the Honorable Jerry Dehovic will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Place your right hand over your heart and pledge with me. I pledge allegiance to the United of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. So good evening, everyone, and welcome. Um, on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce, we want you to know that we host these candidates' forums as a service to the community. In our mission as a catalyst for business growth, a convener of leaders and influencers, and champion for a strong community, the Chamber believes in the importance of providing opportunities for our businesses and our residents to learn about the candidates for our local elections. Over the next month, the Chamber will be hosting or co-hosting seven candidates' forums. A calendar has been placed on your chair for all of these upcoming forums, and it is also, they are all posted on the uh, Chamber's website. In addition, we want to invite you to consider attending the Chamber's annual legislative forum, which will be on Monday, October 3rd. We are honored to have as our speakers at that legislative forum our Congressman Ted Lieu, Senator Ben Allen, Assemblymember Al Moritsuchi, and our Los Angeles County Supervisor Janice Hahn. Tickets for that luncheon are available for purchase on the Chamber's website, and you also have a flyer on your chairs as well. The Chamber is an independent, nonprofit organization, and all businesses, regardless of your location, are invited to join our membership. We want to thank the City of Rancho Palos Verdes for providing the Hess Park facility for our forum this evening. And also, we want to thank RPV TV for taping this evening's um, program. It will be available. Um, we'll have links on the Chamber's website, and they will also be rebroadcasting it. Um, so just so everyone in the room knows, this is being recorded. Um, in addition, I want to thank two of our chamber member businesses for providing the cookies for this evening's forum, and that is Lieb Cody and Company CPAs and RBC Wealth Management. Um, we know that you will all silence your cell phones. Uh, Jerry's going to go through the rules with you, but if you need to get up and take a break, please do so. We are going straight through till 9 o'clock because we have wonderful candidates who, and we want to give them the most time to speak, so it will be a straight through till 9 o'clock. Um, and finally, we do want to thank all of the candidates for stepping up to run, because at the end of the day, it's a big thing to put yourself out there, and we just want to thank you for your interest and commitment in serving our community. So thank you for doing that. It is my pleasure now to introduce, and I also want to thank our volunteers. We have volunteer timers, volunteer card sorters, volunteer question, you know, card hander outer people. We've got them all, so we just want to thank everybody who's, who's helped to put this forum together. Um, I would, it's my honor to introduce Jerry Dehovic, our moderator. Many of you know Jerry, but in case you don't, here's a few high points. Jerry was born in San Pedro and grew up primarily in the Eastview section of Rancho Palos Verdes. He is a graduate of the United States Air Force Academy and a former Air Force officer. He is an owner, partner, and director of a large investment brokerage firm in Orange County, where he serves as its executive vice president, chief administrative officer, and chief compliance officer. So stay on time. <laughs> His expertise is in financial, regulatory, compliance, corporate governments, and employer-related matters. Matters. He previously served as the president of the Nautilus Homeowners Association here in Rancho Palos Verdes, and he currently serves as president of the Seaview HOA, and he is an active neighborhood watch block captain. Um, with regards to his civic involvement, he has served as vice chair of the RPV Finance Advisory Committee. And of course, as most of you know, in 2011, Jerry was elected to the RPV City Council, where he served two terms from 2011 to 2019. And during that tenure, he served as the city's mayor pro tem three times, and also as the city mayor's two times in 2014 and 2019. So we're very honored to have Jerry here with us today as our moderator, and I'm going to turn it over to you, Jerry. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Eileen. That was a bit much. We're trying to save time here. So anyway, good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's event. And thank you for joining us here on a, another beautiful night on the peninsula. Just so you know, I did take the liberty of calling in a favor and told those in charge to turn the heat down, so you have me to thank for that. But seriously, as I'm sure you'll agree, it is a wonderful night outside, and we're all so lucky to call this peninsula home. This is a special night. This is the first candidate forum in what is now uh, an election and campaign season that is in full swing. If you don't know, there are 56 days, exactly eight weeks from tomorrow, the election will be held. There will be several additional candidate forums, as uh, Eileen said, uh, across the peninsula over the next several weeks. I encourage you to participate in those as well. We have an extremely full agenda tonight, a very large group of candidates, but I would be remiss if I didn't thank Eileen and the chamber for all the hard work in putting this forum together. Please give a round of applause. <laughs> She'd be embarrassed that I tell you this, but she worked on her vacation to make it happen, so thank you, Eileen. I'd also like to thank all the volunteers, also as Eileen did, for helping us here tonight, the sponsors, the city of Rancho Palos Verdes, and the city staff working behind the scenes here. But most of all, I would like to thank the nine candidates that are here before you. Serving on the school board is an important position as decisions made by that body affect the entire peninsula. It obviously affects our kids, but it also affects their parents and the community at large, including important items such as our taxes and property values. We are extremely fortunate on the peninsula to have a school district that we've had over the decades. Our shared goal here tonight is for the future to make it an even better board. Finally, putting yourself out there in the public arena as a volunteer to serve your community in any capacity is a daunting, challenging, and time-consuming endeavor. It is something that should be commended and lauded by all. As such, again, before we begin, and we're about to get started with the rules, please give one more nice round of applause for these candidates. They deserve it. So I'm going to do the compliance part of this. I'm going to give you the rules, so please pay attention, okay? This forum is designed to hear directly from the candidates of the PVP USD Board of, for candidates for the PVP USD Board of Education seats. Four seats are open in this election. Please note that there is one seat for a two-year term. There are two candidates running for the two-year term, Aaron Chan and Ami Gandhi. Would you raise your hand so they can see you? Okay. The other candidates are all running for the three seats with the four-year terms. We will not be differentiating between the candidates tonight, this evening, but remember when you go to vote, you'll be voting for one seat with the two-year term and three seats with four-year terms. The time limits tonight will be adhered to as follows, and I will be strict with these. Each candidate will have two minutes for an opening and closing statement. They will have one minute each to answer a given question. They will be given a 15 second time limit, and as soon as the, the time says it's expired, I'm gonna say next candidate, whether you're in mid-sentence or not. I'm not being rude, but we gotta move this along. Uh, the order of questions will rotate throughout the evening. We'll start since we, we seated uh, Jenny here first, we'll start with Aaron with the first question. We'll go on a flow. Um, the initial order was determined by a random drawing earlier this evening. Rebuttals to candidate answers will not be permitted with the sole exception that I as the moderator reserve the right to allow a rebuttal if a candidate specifically quotes or gets called out by another candidate and I believe in my sole discretion that in the spirit of fairness that a rebuttal response is warranted. Rebuttals will be limited to 45 seconds. As an FYI, this forum is being streamed live on Zoom for viewing purposes only. It's also being recorded by RPV TV for future broadcast and may also be viewed on RPV TV's YouTube channel. Individuals are permitted to record this forum. However, if you are recording, please do so without distracting or obstructing the view of any fellow audience members. To allow each candidate as much time to speak, we're gonna be running straight through nine o'clock. That means no breaks, no bathroom breaks, and that's for the candidates also. If you haven't figured it out, nine candidates in a minute each, each question is gonna be about nine minutes long. So they'll have time to get up, let them take care of whatever business they need and come back, okay? Uh, this forum will be run in a polite, professional, and respectful manner. Remember, these candidates are your neighbors. 
and who by stepping forward as a candidate have signaled their willingness to serve our community. We appreciate the audience's cooperation and adherence to maintaining a polite and respectful forum for all of these candidates. Uh, let's see, I think that's about it. And with that, uh, we'll start with the two minute opening statements for each candidate. Uh, please start with your name and the correct pronunciation. And Jenny, please. Good evening, everyone. I want to say thank you first to the Chamber of Commerce for putting this on tonight. I'm so excited to see so many people here that want to learn about the candidates. And since we want to learn about the candidates, let me tell you all why you should vote for me. My name is Jennifer Hanjan, but everyone calls me Jenny. I grew up in SoCal and benefited from a great public school education where I went to Vanderbilt University and then on to USC. Fight on. I spent my whole career in music and entertainment negotiating major deals with record companies, athletes, celebrities, and artists. Now I'm a stay-at-home mom to Audrey Jane, who's in fifth grade, and Charlie, who's in seventh. I've now become what my husband calls a professional volunteer. I've coached almost every sport on this hill, been the PTA president twice, sat on the uh, PTA council, and I'm currently the EVP over at PVIS. I was also on the board of trust for several years for my synagogue and the Girl Scout cookie co-chair for my daughter's troop, which is why I'm here today. I'm deeply committed and invested in our community. I want to be an advocate for our kids and parents and make sure that PVP USD lives up to its reputation of excellence. If elected, I plan to focus on three things. I call them my three C's, curriculum, collaboration, and commitment. Curriculum, I want to identify the best in class curriculum that exceeds state standards in math, reading, science, and history. Review other top districts, what they're doing, take a best practices approach, and implement them here so we can improve. Collaboration, I wanna work with parents and teachers to zero in on what really requires attention from, at all levels, from elementary to high school. And finally, commitment. I promise to give 110% to the parents, students, and residents of Palos Verdes. My volunteerism is evidence of that. PV is our home, and I will always put the needs of our community, not the state or the county, first. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. But before we move on to Aaron, before we move on to Aaron, one big point I failed to mention was that we will be accepting questions from the audience throughout the evening. So please feel free to find one of the note cards and put your question uh, that you would like to get answered. Please understand that we're trying to cover as many topics as possible. Uh, we may eliminate duplicative, redundant, or multi-part questions. One thing also I did want to announce is that we have uh, Julie Hamill participating. She's a candidate uh, remotely via Zoom. She's up on the screen there, and we'll get to her. So thank you. Aaron, please proceed. Good evening. Uh, my name is Aaron Chan. My wife and I moved to Palace Road about 28 years ago. We raised two children who graduated from Peninsula High and went on to um, attend UCLA and NYU. We are very thankful for the school system here. The quality of education is what attracted us to Palo Alto in the first place. Uh, sadly, I, I, I'm seeing that the school system has been declining steadily. Um, the finances have been weakened to a critical stage and the school board has not been uh, transparent and has not set clear goals for improvement that I can see. Uh, did you know that the, the uh, district's ac academic ranking has sunk steadily since 2010? PV High's math and reading scores have dropped below California averages. We didn't move here for that reason. Uh, the, the district is now three, at least $309 million in debt, and uh, the districts for the last 12 years out of nine out of 12 spend more money than they receive from the government. So I am running uh, for position on the board to improve three things, academic, ranking, financial health, and accountability and transparency. I'm running against the formidable opponent, Ms. Gandhi there. Uh, my background, I have an uh, engineering degree, undergrad and an MBA from Carnegie Mellon. Uh, I'm in uh, business operations, business, um, improvement projects all my life. I have tons of experience, over 30 years of managing very significant projects. I think I can br bring much needed business discipline and management experience to our district. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aaron. 
Sara, are you ready? Good evening, and thank you, Chamber of Commerce, for gathering us today with our neighbors here. My name is Sara Dean. I was born in California and raised through our public school system because halfway around the world, when my dad was a teen, he saw this country put a man on the moon. And in that moment, he knew that this was the place to be for world-class education and innovation. So when my husband and I were looking to find a place to settle with our two kids, world-class education was at the top of our list. And we've been thrilled with a lot of the resources that the district has offered us. But we've also run into some of the challenges. Most of us parents are not experts on learning disabilities or reading curriculum. We often have a sense that our kids got this great talent, but something's getting in their way. And sometimes our kids' learning needs are not met because our kid learns in a different way. Sometimes our kids end up disengaged in the classroom. Sometimes they're written off as reluctant readers or poorly behaved. So I want to work with the district to reduce the challenges around accessing and understanding special education and learning accommodations, while also ensuring that our curriculum works for more learning needs. It works for all kids. Uh, we also just have to make it easier for our students to access mental health support. To start, I'd like to work with the district in articulating fully and implementing our suicide prevention plan and to ensure adequate mental health therapists at each school site. As a dentist, I learned to listen deeply and unconditionally to people when they're not their most articulate and help them identify their pain points. I collaboratively put together a treatment plan which worked for my patients' goals and budgets, and I'm hoping to bring those skills to the school district. The ability to listen deeply and unconditionally and together identify points of shared need and to work collaboratively with the community on a plan to continue our district's improvements so that the world's brightest continue to be attracted to this beautiful community community on the peninsula. Thank you. Thank you. Now, now we're going to check our technology. Julie, let's give it a shot. All right. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Proceed, please. Great. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Eileen. And thank you to the chamber for hosting this debate and allowing me to appear remotely. I'm up in the Olympic uh, National Forest with my family. And we planned this trip long before I even knew that I would be running for the board. So I really appreciate it. I know there's a little bit of glitchiness in the sound. I'm just going to power through. Um, I'm Julie Hamill, and I have some common sense solutions to help get our district back on track. Um, first, we need to restore our once excellent level of education. We need to support parents' rights. And we need to make our policies and processes transparent. I'll ensure that we publicly weigh the harms against the benefits of every policy that we implement and that we debate issues openly in a public forum where all members of the community are welcomed and respected. We will have no more closed door committee decision making. Um, I've worked for the United States Department of Justice. I've litigated on behalf of cities and districts. So I understand how government transparency is supposed to work. And I will bring that experience to the board. One I'll take minute. a stand to ensure that ideas, ideas are not censored and that diverse perspectives are welcomed. I want to create an environment where parents are engaged, informed in every aspect of their children's education. I will ensure that every dollar spent places our kids as the number one priority. Every dollar spent must be used in a way that benefits our children and improves outcomes. We need a full review of the budget to eliminate waste on political agendas and ideology. Um, half of my kids left our district over the last two years and they haven't come back. So we need a real honest evaluation of why and what, if anything, we can do to bring them back to our district. Um, 15 seconds. Three little boys in TV schools. I'm deeply invested in making our schools the best that they can possibly be and giving our kids every opportunity to succeed and thrive. I'll never stop fighting for our kids, and I'm willing to stand alone to put our kids' interests as the district's top priority. Thank you, Thank Julie. You. Thank you. <laughs> Next is Jean Lou Kristen. Jean? Thank you, Chamber, for hosting this. My name is Jean Lou Kristen. Great. I'm a Thank mom you. of... Can you still hear me? I'm a mom of six girls. I have three, and we have, Paul and I have three in college. We have one at UC Davis, one at the University of Greenwich in London, and one at the United States Naval Academy. 
Leathernecks, okay. Um, we also have three still in PVP USD, one at Point Vicente, third grade, one at Ridgecrest, and one at Peninsula High School. I'm also a film producer and this chief operating officer for a international media company that supports women in entertainment. For the past two years, though, I've been the Penn Peninsula High School PTA president. And under my leadership, we, we pivoted. That was during COVID. We pivoted, took all of our meetings online, and we also, um, while everything was contracting, we were expanding. We actually widened our tent, include more people. We translate documents into Japanese, Chinese, and Korean. That's our demographics of Peninsula, half of which are Asian. Um, we also had coffee chats and parent-to-parent -parent support online. And um, we have also started a disability subcommittee that we promoted and advocated for children with I, um, IEPs and 504s. Um, under my leadership, we were the first to win the National PTA School of Excellence Award, and I won the two consecutive national, I'm sorry, state honorary service award. Um, I want to be a school board member because I want to keep the momentum that we started at Peninsula High School going. I bought, I'm able to work with both sides, hearing all the parents' concern. Parents' input is very important to me, as well as teachers and admins. I think it's important that we work together. I'm able to do that. I want to continue to do that and expand to the rest of the schools. I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Jeremy Vanderhall. Good evening, everybody. Thank you to the PVP Chamber of Commerce for hosting this, and thank you to all of you for showing up, as well as you at home, for, for showing your interest in the, in the community and the candidates that affect our, that our, our issues here. My name is Jeremy Vanderhall, and I'm a candidate for, uh, for the PVP School Board. Uh, I grew up in LA, and I attended uh, public school there until about second grade, uh, at which time my, my parents, uh, out of concern for my education, pulled me out and sent me to a private school, and I'm grateful for the opportunities that I had there. Uh, and I really believe it set me on my path. From there, I went to the Air Force Academy as well, uh, and I became a military pilot, and I traveled all around the country uh, for several years before I came back to, uh, to live in California. Uh, while I was there, when I, when I got back to California, I met my beautiful wife, uh, Katie, who's uh, from PV and, uh, and went to Peninsula High School. Uh, when we decided to start a family, we chose to come back to PV specifically because of the high quality public schools here. So I have three engineering degrees and a business degree, which means that I'm a data nerd uh, and I like to do objective analysis of facts. But I also have a three-year-old daughter, uh, which means that I have to be passionate about things. Uh, and I have a sense of duty to protect her uh, and give her the best opportunity for success at life. My military career gave me opportunities to uh, participate in and lead groups of people from diverse backgrounds working towards one common goal. Uh, and also, uh, I had to deal with the challenge of resolving conflicts of interest and, uh, and, and competing interests uh, while operating programs with, uh, that had budgets of millions and sometimes even billions of dollars. Uh, I'm running for school board because my passion to, to serve my community compels me to use uh, my experience to address the issues that I see uh, facing our school district. And those issues are school safety, academic standards, parental involvement, the state of finances, uh, and our ability to, to attract and retain uh, high quality teachers. I'm looking forward to the opportunity tonight to talk about all those uh, issues in depth with everybody here. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Before we move to the next candidate, let me just announce I have about 20 questions here and if all moves smoothly tonight, we'll maybe get to seven or eight. So I think we're good with the questions right now. So thank you everybody. These are excellent questions and I'm filtering through them now. Next we have Ami Gandhi. First, I just wanted to say thank you so much to the Chamber of Commerce for hosting this event tonight. It's so great to see so many familiar faces in the audience. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Ami Gandhi, and I'm a mother of a third and a fifth grader in the district. I'm invested in the strong education for which PV schools are known for, and I understand the academic and the social-emotional challenges our students face on a daily basis. I was appointed to the board last year, chosen over 13 other candidates, because of my honesty, empathy, and nonpartisan approach to governance. Over the last year as a board member, I have worked every day to forge strong relationships and have gained the respect of key stakeholders across the district. I grew up in Southern California and became a resident of RPV five years ago. Like many other families, I moved here with my husband and two young children just so that my kids could be a part of PVPUSD. 
I have a bachelor's degree from USC and a master's degree in public health from Loma Linda University. In addition to serving on the Board of Education for PVPUSD, I also serve on the Board of Vector Control for the city, as well as the Board of a nonprofit organization called Luna Peak Foundation. I believe in celebrating our successes. We are part of an amazing school district with a track record of success. We should be proud of what we have accomplished, and yet we should continuously strive to do better. As a current board member, I bring credibility and a track record of putting our kids first. I have maintained neutrality and taken balanced views when dealing with issues facing our children. As a parent of young children, I have brought a new voice as an elementary parent in the district. I have been endorsed by multiple board members, city council members, and community members. If elected, I will continue to be a voice for our students, focusing on academic growth, prioritizing emotional and mental health, and most importantly, helping our students thrive. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next, we have Linda Kurt. Linda. Hi, I'm Linda Kurt, and I think many of you know me already. My goal is for the children of Palos Verdes to receive the best education possible. To do that, I will focus on enhancing academic programs, providing additional support for the children, and making our facilities safe and modern. My background is that of a mom, a teacher, and a leader. My husband and I raised four children in the school district. They were all well prepared for college and are now happily and successfully pursuing their careers. This is what I wanted for my children, for my students, and what I want for all the children of Palos Verdes. In June, I retired from 37 years of teaching math and science at the middle and high school level here in Palos Verdes. Every year, I work to raise the academic bar and to help the students find their pathway to success. The answers to the problems have not changed over the years, but the needs of the students and the methodologies have. As a leader, I was the math department chair, a math coach, a Girl Scout leader for many years, a swim coach. In everything I do, I am child-focused, solutions-oriented, a team player, conscientious, and positive. PV is an excellent school district with capable, motivated students, supportive, involved parents, and highly qualified staff. Yet with my background as a mom whose children have gone through the school system, my years of teaching experience, and my propensity for leadership, I know we can continue to improve. For the specifics of my platform, I hope you will visit my website, lindakurt4pvpusd.com, to learn more and to learn how you can support me. Tonight, I hope you know that I'm speaking from years of experience that back my opinions, that I am genuine and will always tell you what I think, even if it is not what I think you want to hear, and that if I don't know the answer, I will do the research to find out. Thank you for listening, and thank you for having me. Thank you. And last but not least, Matt Brock. Hi, my name is Matthew Brock, and I am currently a board member for PVP USD. Uh, a little too close to the microphone there. And uh, but I also served as president of PVP USD and president of the SoCal Regional Occupation Center. And I am really proud of the service that our district has provided. I'm proud of the staff. I am proud of our teachers and our administration for leading us through a pandemic and these challenging times that nobody expected. When I ran four years ago, I ran on fiscal responsibility. I ran on mental health and we accomplished those. We now have a balanced budget with a surplus. We have more mental health positions. We have a mental health coordinator. Uh, everything we set out to do, we did despite the pandemic. But during the pandemic, we really learned where people stood. And I think it was very clear that I stood for parents and students and that I was there to fight for their right for an education and for them to choose that education, whether it was distance learning, to have the most robust distance learning academy we could have, or if it was fighting to get our students back in person. It was always student driven. And I believe that our job is to prepare our students to go out into the world and that we have a wonderful district to help them get there. But as some of my fellow candidates mentioned, not every student has the same path and we need to identify those paths and make sure that we are presenting every student with an opportunity to go out and succeed. 
Uh, before I was a school board member, I had 15 seconds. I was a government contractor in counterterrorism and force protection. I owned a small business, and my degree is in psychology from Northwestern University. I have two children, one at UPenn and one at Penn. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> Thank you, thank you all candidates. That was very well done. We have uh, a lot of interesting questions here and we're, we're not gonna spare any zingers. So we'll go ahead and get started. I'm gonna move quickly, briskly, and as I told you, if you go over the minute, I'm gonna say next candidate and you're done. So, okay, first question, and we're gonna start with Aaron. So the rest of you have plenty of time to think as we move on here. What do you think the level and process of parental involvement should be with respect to the district curriculum decision making? Specifically, should such decisions be the sole purview of the elected school board members? Aaron. I believe that uh, parents should have a lot of rights in deciding what curriculum, what textbooks are being used and what are being taught to the kids. I attended school board members uh, sorry, school board meetings uh, in the last few months, and I have seen some parents who are in violent uh, disagreement with the way they were being uh, shut out of the curriculum selection process. So I believe that the voice of the customer, the who are the parents, they are our customers. They should totally be involved with the selection of curriculum and textbooks. Thank you. Next candidate. I totally think parents have a role to play in curriculum. Um, I have found the district to be open when it came to reviewing content. You're able to visit the district office and see it. Um, I do think we need to do a better job of communicating the process for curriculum adoption in our school district. Neighboring Redondo Beach, they adopted a really great early literacy program recently. And on their website, you can easily track who was on the committee, what kind of conversations they had, what things they considered and how they reached their conclusion. I think that really helps us establish trust uh, between the school district and families. So certainly I think there is a need for more openness and better communication with families. Thank you. Jean? I absolutely agree that parents need to be involved and informed about what their children are doing and learning in school. Um, for that to happen, I think that the parents need to be informed in a timely manner. The process procedures need to be very transparent. There is, the school district does have a process. It is very clear. However, it's not well communicated, nor is it very accessible. Those are things that we dealt with at Peninsula High School. There was information structure in place, but it was not communicated or made accessible. The information was not disseminated. That's why we translate into three languages. I think accessibility is an issue. And I think that that's something that we can definitely work on and improve. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Please stand by. I skipped Julie. Julie, would you like to proceed? Um, I'm a cornerstone parent, so obviously I appreciate parental involvement in our kids' education. Parents absolutely need to be involved. State law actually requires that board members review all learning materials um, and approve them, and parents are authorized under, under the law to review those learning materials. I will make sure that all of our learning materials are available for any parent who wishes to review them and make them easily accessible. Thank you. Thank you. Jeremy? I think, it's, I think it's a pretty clear cut that we are elected in order to represent the people of the Palos Verdes Peninsula Unified School District. So uh, if they are, if we are their representatives, if we then ignore what they, what they want, uh, we're not really doing our jobs. So the, the, the bottom line is that the, the parents need to be involved uh, in, the, in the decision making uh, regarding, regarding curriculum. Thank you. Ami? Yeah, you know, I absolutely believe that parents should be involved in um, in decisions and in the curriculum. You know, one of the reasons, um, you know, a year and a half ago I interviewed and I was appointed to the board is because I believe that parents should be involved in decisions affecting their children. Um, as a district, we have many um, we have many things in place to make sure we have parental involvement, including the curriculum committee, and we have advisory committees, and we have a process for when a new curriculum is adopted. It's reviewed for an entire year and parents are allowed to contribute at any point in that process. And these are parents whose kids are part of the school district. But the last thing I would like to say is that there's also other stakeholders that are also important such as teachers and administrators that have an expertise in the subject matter. So 
while I believe in parental involvement, I also believe that their opinion should be valued as well. Thank you. Thank you. Linda? I think a lot of this comes down to the state standards. And the state standards were written by experts in the various fields who have far more knowledge with this curriculum than I do. That being said, the textbooks are written to align with the curriculum that the state has chosen. And the teachers are obligated to teach that curriculum. That being said, parents should be involved in what is being taught to their child. And the district has, as you said, well spelled out pro protocols about how the parents are to be notified and the timeline for notifying them. And for topics that parents would prefer to teach their child at home, they can opt their child out in science and in, and in social studies. Thank you. Matt? Thank you. Parents absolutely need to be involved. When parents and students, or parents and teachers work together, students succeed, they prosper. When they're at odds with each other, they're struggles. And sometimes with curriculum, it's what the unknown is what scares people. And allowing parents to see what exactly is being taught kind of turns that light on. We're all afraid of the dark and the noises we hear in the dark. But sometimes you turn the light on, you're like, OK, that's not so bad. And sometimes you go, you know, that is bad. And we need to, to adjust, adjust it. And when you're talking about curriculum, anytime you add something, you're taking something else away. So you have to make sure that what we are adding to our curriculum is more valuable than what we're taking away. So absolutely, parents need to be involved in this process. That's why as, on, as a board member, I tried to establish the Curriculum Advisory Committee, which would have had parents be an appointed position from the board so that they could help us review the content. Because yes, it is the board's responsibility to ultimately approve curriculum. And it's not something we can um, dismiss. Thank you, and Jenny? Um, as Julie said, per the Ed Code, parents have an absolute right to review and provide feedback on all curriculum. And I know that our district does have a process for reviewing curriculum and providing feedback and pilot testing programs. My son Charlie was involved in, in piloting the new history textbooks. But the interesting about that is, had he not been a part of that, I wouldn't have been made aware of it. So I think that the district could certainly do a better job when it comes to communicating with parents. The, of all the children that would ultimately be impacted so that they have an opportunity to review the material and provide feedback to see where they land as well as the teachers before we move forward with the new curriculum, new textbooks, and new materials. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, candidates, for those crisp answers. You don't need to fill that whole minute to give a complete answer, <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, next question, we'll start with Sara. How would you specifically work with community partners and the cities to address and handle students' mental health needs? Oh, that's a great one. Um, and it is, is your mic on? I'm sorry. Sorry, that's a, that's a really great one. And honestly, um, the board and the school district has really done a good job setting the intentions to support mental health better, but we still need to do better. For example, the Palos Verdes High School the link, the Google form to request an appointment for, with a therapist is still not working, and that's just not okay. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we don't have the recommended number of school-based therapists at each site. Super important. Um, I, I do think there's great potential to collaborate with our um, local cities and community organizations to increase awareness around the mental health issues affecting our students. It has to be done in community, cannot be done solely with the district. Increasing awareness around suicide prevention and anxiety is really critical. So I would love to work with our community partners on that. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Actually, we're not going to skip Julie again. Julie, you're next. Actually, let me do this. Go ahead, Julie. You know, we really need accountability for what we stole from our kids over the last few years. And they deserve a promise from us that we will never again keep them from their friends, from their schools, their sports, their joyful activities ever again. And they need to be able to rely on us and look forward to the future with hope. Our kids need stability and we stole that from them. So, you know, I think having mental health professionals accessible is obviously very important but we need to look at the underlying issues and how did we get to this place where we are in the midst of a horrible adolescent mental health crisis. I've shared my own personal story with my severe anxiety and panic attacks on my blog and I welcome people to read that because I think it would have helped me when I was 17 years old. 
Um, but we really need to um, be accountable to our kids for what we did to them over the last few years. 15 so seconds. Thank you. Thank you. Jean? Thank you for whoever wrote this question. It's a very important issue. I think COVID really exacerbated what was already um, sort of building underneath. I think it needs a whole community, especially parent involvement, because they spend a large portion of their time at home, these kids do. Do you know as parents what your kids are watching? I, I say euphoria or I say 13 reasons. These are all mature audiences that are middle schools. Uh, students are watching streaming on their own without an adult processing it with them. So I think the mental health moment is a vast, um, it's, it's, a, it's global for the child. We need to make sure that they are not hopeless, that they're consuming content that feeds them. At the same time, we also as a school district need to understand how we're spending money, how effective is it? We spent a lot of money on mental health. Are the SAGE therapists working? We need to figure out what is, what's not. We are collecting Thank some you, data, Jean. but not Thank all. Thank you. Thank you. Jeremy. My wife is a psychiatrist and I've, I've talked at length about this with her. Uh, and it's, it's a real fine line to walk. On the one hand, you want the you want the mental health professionals there and, and able and able uh, and available to talk to students if they need it if they're not comfortable talking to their parents. Um, but I think Jean hit on something really important, which is that parents need to be involved uh, in that in that process. They need to be made aware. Uh, hey, your 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 son or daughter uh, saw a mental health. So because the the parents are the ones that are the most vested in the interest of the child. Uh, you know, nobody, nobody's going to love that. Nobody's going to love that boy or girl any more than, than their parents do. So whatever, whatever mental health resources we offer, which, which I'm, I'm for, uh, those need to be, we need to make sure that we loop in the parents at all stages of the process to make sure that they're invested in it as well. Thank you. Ami. Um, in addition to our SAGE therapists, which we already have present on our campuses, um, I have two ideas for mental health. So the first is we need to get our younger kids involved. And by getting them involved, it's creating a sense of community on our campuses so that each child feels like they have a sense of belonging. Um, the second part is with our postgraduates. Our kids, when they're in high school, they have so many different res resources available to them. And, and then they graduate and they're kind of left trying to figure figure things out on their own. So my suggestion is to come up with a program um, for our graduates and partner up with community members, including city council and board members, so that the kids have a transitional program and somebody that they could reach out to once they graduate. So if they are ever feeling alone or anxious, they have somebody they could reach to. Thank you. Thank you. Linda? We have increased the number of therapists on our campus, but I would agree, we are not doing enough. We should talk to the district and community experts to seek solutions. Um, some colleges do a weekly check-in with their students, and it only goes to the student's counselor, nowhere else. Uh, we do need a connection for every kid. Every kid needs to feel like they belong somewhere. Um, and it was raised at the last board meeting, the idea that we also need to take care of our children who are our recent graduates and make sure that they feel that they still have a home here. Thank you. Matt? I would like to thank Ami and, and Linda for those two great points. It is a connection that is so important for our students to feel like they belong on campus. It could be the custodian, it could be the lunch lady, it could be the attendance clerk, somebody who sees them and says, hey, it's great to see you, and that student feels good about themselves. Our students who are comfortable and feel safe will learn much faster than a student who is feeling depressed. And that it was one of the reasons I originally ran was because one in four to one in three of our students were depressed or actually had suicidal thoughts. And that's not acceptable. And the pandemic has made it worse. Uh, we went from perhaps 20 cases to 40. We doubled at some of our middle schools. And we just can't have that. So we have been putting resources in. Uh, it was under uh, my first few months on the board that I requested a mental health coordinator. So we had somebody who would oversee all of our programs so that we could make sure that we were doing as much as we could for kids. And you're absolutely right. Once our students leave, they've had their hand held for a long time. And now they're off on their own. They're kind of struggling and failing. And that's where we see a lot of kids really hurting. And uh, so our district has worked with local councils already. We've reached out to them. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Jenny. Thank you. 
I think this is a great question, but I hope when we talk about community partners that we're taking the time to involve parents and coaches and grandparents because those people truly make up our children's community. The, the bulk of the time they spend is not necessarily in school, it's outside of school. I think it would be wonderful if, whether it's with the district or the city or other places, we could come up with programs to maybe help parents, help their coaches, help their grandparents to identify when there's going to be a problem so that they can help their children as well. There's so much time that's spent outside of school. I think we need to invest in some time and effort into the other stakeholders in those children's lives, which oftentimes, most always, is their family. Thank you. Thank you. And Aaron? Yes, I believe that uh, mental health is as important as physical health. When the kids get sick at school, we have to t attend to them, we, uh, whether they are physically or mentally ill. But my, um, I think it's a matter of balance. You know, if the school, if the kids get sick at school, do we, you have school nurses to take care of them, but we don't hire doctors to be on campus to take care of them. I volunteered for five years on a CASA program, which stands for Court Appointed Special Advocate. I was dealing with the special needs kids with schizophrenia. I was involved with the selection of um, therapists for this kid. It's a very complicated process. It's, it involves a lot of parental uh, involvement. The parents need to know, the kids need to know. So I, I'm for that, but I need, I think the parents should be involved and they should be scaled accordingly. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next question, we'll start with Julie and it's a bit of a softball. I think you've touched on this a little bit in your opening, but if you could get specific, what do you consider the district's greatest strength and weaknesses are? And Julie, you have the floor. I think is transparency and creating a place where people's voices are heard and um, respected. I, I feel like there are some real problems with gatekeeping and keeping people who have different opinions um, from getting onto committees and being heard and having uh, a voice in policy making. In terms of the benefits, we have a brilliant community. We have brilliant people who love their children who love their community, they're talented, they offer their, their talents in, through volunteering and everyone is willing to help, help and contribute. And I think that, that our people are our greatest strength. Thank you. Thank you. Jean? Well, having had uh, one of our daughters at Naval Academy and all the, the college, uh, sorry, high school graduates, they say how well the schools here prepare them academically. So I, I know that we're strong. I also agree that we have an amazing parent, um, um, knowledge, knowledgeable and professional group of parents here. Um, I think where we are missing the mark, it, I agree with Julie, is transparency and communication. I think there are processes in place. It's not nefarious. I don't think they're doing it on purpose, they, um, the district. But I do think that we have to have an open dialogue and communication and understanding of everyone's process. And that's what we, I was able to do, again, with Peninsula, is the largest school on campus. There's a lot of voices, a lot of stakeholders, but listening to one another, understanding, providing information that's lacking, and move forward from there. So I do agree that there's a... Uh, apparent lack of transparency and communication. Thank you, Jean. Jeremy. This room is packed full of people from the community and there's overflow room. Uh, so I think it's pretty clear that the strength of this, uh, of this district is, is the people. The people are, are, are invested and motivated and dedicated to making this the best, the best uh, school district in, in LA and California and, and the country. Um, and, and, it, and it has been. It's, been. it's been great. We've been doing it here. In fact, everybody that I talk to says they move here because of the schools. Um, but I think that leads to our weakness, which is I worry a little bit that we're resting on our laurels a little bit. We've done, we've done really well for the last several years, but there's indicators that, that it, might be, it might be slipping in the wrong direction. Um, and maybe there's some ego involved or maybe not, but, but maybe it takes an outside look to say, hey, what is, what's going on? Why are, we, why are we slipping? And if so, how can we fix that and, and bring us back up to that uh, elite status that, that we all know PV should be? Thank you. Ami? 
There are so many strengths to our amazing school district. One being the academic excellence. Um, number two, which is something Jeremy just touched upon, that's our community and the community involvement. In addition to that, we have high test scores, we have high AP scores, and we have highly competitive um, college acceptance rates. So our school district is a pretty amazing place to be. Um, when we're talking about weaknesses, you know, I believe I said in my opening, there's always something that we can work on. So one piece that um, we've discussed a lot is communication and the fact that we have room to improve our communication with the public. Now, there are challenges there because there's certain issues, such as those issues that relate to HR, where you can't openly communicate. However, any time that we can communicate, we should. Thank you. Thank you. Linda? Our greatest strengths are our capable, motivated students, our supportive, involved parents, and our highly qualified staff, teachers, and administrators. And if I'm on the board, I think every single meeting, we should celebrate one of our schools. Our greatest weaknesses, I think, is that we are somewhat micromanaged. We have hired great people, and we should empower them to do uh, to fly. Um, we have a very competitive attitude within the schools, and instead we should have an attitude of cooperation and trust and bring people together to solve our problems. We should focus on communication. The board makes decisions and the teachers are not informed. The board makes decisions and the community doesn't know what's happening in the schools. And additionally, the, the community would benefit in terms of passing a bond measure if they had more knowledge of what was going on in the schools. Thank you. Thank you. Matt. Our strength is our focus on doing what's right for children. Everybody in this room, every parent, wants their children to succeed. And that is where our strength truly lies, because we all have one common goal. Our weakness is in communication. I will agree, as you can hear from my fellow candidates. There seems to be questions. And when they say transparency, transparency is actually not the correct word. Transparency means that that information is available. Everything that we do is out in the open and it's available. How we communicate that, how we allow that information to get out is so important. And that's one of the reasons uh, I actually suggested that we have a communications committee, right? I believe in committees and getting the community to help because I understand that we can do a better job communicating and that would alleviate a lot of the concerns that we have. Thank you. Jenny? Um, I believe that uh, at our district, the, the great, its greatest strength is its parents and its teachers. You have parents that offer their time, their money, their expertise, their absolute love and devotion to the kids in their schools. And then you have our teachers who put their blood, their sweat, their tears into educating our kids and preparing them for the next level, whether that's moving from first to second grade or, or up to college. And I think that that's a phenomenal thing. I do believe that our weakness is that we're sort of relying on our reputation and our laurels. And I think that there's always an opportunity to improve, not just academically, but look at our arts programs, our athletics, uh, the different extracurriculars that we do. There's always something more that can be done to make it better for, for our students. Thank you. Thank you. Aaron? Yeah, I agree that uh, our strength is basically our reputation. PV has very high, is a pre, very prestigious area. Uh, why do we have good prestige? Because we have good schools, we have good citizens that support the community. Just look at yourself out here. Eight o'clock in the evening, you're out here listening to a bunch of guys talking about education. Uh, the and communication girls. part is, <laughs> communication part is, I think, absolutely important because there was one school board meeting, I remember, one of the school board members said, I was on vacation last week and I wasn't able to participate in the school board meeting. I was viewing it from the distance. And let me tell you, I think we need to improve on our communication and the appearance of being like, we know what we're doing, okay? So I think that piece is, is really important that we need to become, uh, improve. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Sarah. You'd be hard pressed to find a district with parents that are more, more motivated and present in the schools. And I think that is our greatest strength. My kids would probably wish that we were slightly less involved and less present. Um, communication is clearly a problem with our district. I don't think it's intentional. I actually pivoted from dentistry five years ago and I have spent five years studying the art of communication, specifically the art of communication across conflict, uh, de-escalation, and how 
to communicate and be engaged with those that we disagree with, which I think is going to be a really handy skill. So I'm really excited and looking forward to how I can help the district communicate more openly and in a way that the message is received by everybody, all stakeholders in the community. Thank you. All right. Uh, next question is for Jean. Uh, what are your plans, if any, to create and promote school safety? That's a great question again. Um, for me, I feel that the greatest strength is a deterrent to protect our kids. And that would be uh, creating a community. That's based on um, what we've heard is each child having a point of contact. The parents are involved, we recognize strangers. I rather surround our kids with community rather than a fence all around. That takes money. It also is not exactly preventative. People climb over fences all the time to defame um, our property, et cetera. But the other thing is that if we could, um, I had an idea of having parents or fathers come in. We have. We have military people in our in our midst. If we can broadcast that these our um, parent volunteers come in and they're patrolling and they recognize the kids, that is a deterrent. Another way is I think we are added another resource officer as well that shows up on different campuses. And Thank that's you, also Jane. another deterrent. Thank, Thank you. you, Jeremy. I'm really glad that whoever it is asked this question asked it uh, because it gives an opportunity, an opportunity to talk about the three committees that I would want to uh, form when I when I get there. The first one being the the safety review committee, uh, and I'll talk more too about the other ones later, the academic and the finance committee. But for the safety review committee, I think it's time, especially considering the the, the recent events in Uvalde. Uh, to do a top-down review of all of our security and safety procedures uh, to include personnel and training and, uh, and facilities. And I want to loop in uh, the PV, PVE police, and I want to loop in Lumi, the sheriff's department, and maybe even look at um, consultants that are, that are experts in, in school safety. And that is item number one on, on my list uh, for doing that. Good on, on uh, the, the previous board for, um, for hiring two uh, SROs. Uh, I think that's a good first step. Uh, and I am not a security expert, uh, but I want to find the people that are uh, and, and do that. So that, that would be item number one for me. Thank you. Ami? Um, of course, safety is the top priority for the district. And everyone is concerned with student safety, including me. I have two young kids in the district. Um, and we're actively engaging with our local police departments to see what can be done. The, you know, And everything is on the table. We're looking at all options, including fences, cameras, and um, I increasing the number of SROs that we have. So really, um, we're looking at all options. And if somebody comes to us and says, hey, this is the best option and this is the best way to keep our school safe, we're open to, to that. Thank you. Thank you. Linda? This is very important and many people are concerned about this. I think the district is already working towards a solution. Um, the teachers wrote a memorandum saying that it was very important to them to work in safe schools and that the children should have safe schools to come to. And I don't think there's a single person who would disagree with that. Um, so I think they've already consulted law enforcement. The district is already working on it. Administration is already working on it. And the solution is outside my scope of abilities. Um, but I do think it's very important that we find a solution. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> Thank you. So yes, we are working with local law enforcement in uh, how we are addressing the safety concerns. And something to keep in mind is that for every action that we do, you have to look at the unintended consequence. Fences might seem like a great idea, but you have to make sure that you're not creating a worse situation by putting a fence up. It doesn't mean that we cannot layer. I mean, what we're looking at here is layering an approach to safety. And a big component of that is mental health. It is very clear from data that the people who usually return are former students. So it's making sure that we identify students who are in crisis because until they pull that trigger, they are still a kid and we still want to help them. And so when it comes to safety, we are working with law enforcement, but I would not like to discuss too much what we are doing in a public forum, but we do talk, discuss this in closed session. Thank you, Jenny. As a mother of two young kids, safety is obviously very important to me. Um, if elected to the school board, I would love to see us do a full assessment of every single campus, exactly what they have going on, 
what they could do to improve, what maybe they need. I'll give an example. When I was the PTA president at Montemalaga, we bought blinds, safety blinds, for all of the classrooms that could be dropped at a moment's notice. God forbid there was an intruder or a situation on campus, so they would not be able to see into the classrooms and make the children a target. I'm not sure if the other schools have that, but that was something that we did at Montemalaga. So I would love to know what the other schools have. I also like Jean's idea. I think it's a great idea to involve our community when you have retired police officers, retired military, that maybe they'll be able to help out and provide, as she said, a deterrence. Just by knowing there's a presence there, I think sometimes people are less likely to do something bad. Thank you. Thank you. Aaron. Yeah, safety is on everybody's mind with all the recent shootings on campuses. So it's not something that we take lightly. However, I'm like a lot of you are expressing that I'm not an expert in safety, so I have to rely on people who know. I don't want to prescribe a solution thinking that I, I know everything about uh, safety. And that's the strength of a good board that you have a diversity of uh, talents and knowledge like Jeremy. He's trying to create this team that would help us uh, understand the safety measures that we need to take. And I think that's basically be humble enough to listen to the experts and put a program in place that's systematic and thorough. Thank you. Sarah. It's really hard to send your kids to school the day after a school shooting in our country. Um, but it's also important to remember that most, most school shooters are students or recent graduates, so a fence may or may not help. Most of them access guns from a family member or a neighbor. Um, what we can do as board members, we can remind our district community about California's uh, secure gun storage laws as well as the extreme risk law. Um, in our school environment, we can work on teaching our kids how to resolve conflict, how to de-escalate. We need to teach them the difference between reporting and tattling. In school shootings, the perpetrator usually very widely announces what they're about to do, but the children do not report it. So in empowering our kids to report is important. Mental health, of course, uh, we need to address and ensuring that every kid has a meaningful connection to at least one adult on campus also prevents school shootings. Other barriers like internal door locks on our classroom doors and also single Thank controlled you. entry. Thank you very much. Julie. Thank you very much. Um, we need a full audit of our physical safety in the district at every campus. We need to identify risks and rationally assess their likelihood and potential harms. I'm not just talking about shooters, I'm talking about all sorts of physical safety. I'm a former member of the Association of Threat Assessment Professionals. We need to engage experts. They are out there, there are many. Um, I've been speaking with experts across the country and I'm putting together a, a town hall Zoom and I, I will share that information when it's um, ready, but we're gonna be discussing the best ways to enhance student safety on campus. And this is not specific to our sites, but it's going to be discussing, having experts from around the country discuss the different avenues and their risks and benefits and parents can ask questions. We need to have an open forum, get by community. seconds. And that's all I'll say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next question, we'll start with Jeremy. Getting into facilities issues. Specifically, what do you see as some of the biggest facilities concerns and issues, and how would you, how would you obtain the funding to address them? Uh, I actually spoke to my neighbor the other day who's, a, who's an elementary school teacher in the district, and she said her number one concern is the air conditioning. This, uh, this summer, it was, uh, it was in here up too. in 80, 86 degrees in the classroom. And I mean, aside from it you know, just not being conducive to learning, it's, it's unsafe you know, for, for people to be you know, trapped in that kind of heat for that long time. So uh, I think, the pe first of all, the, I, don't, I don't know the answer of what facility it should be or what facilities upgrades should happen, but the people that are, that are in the schools every day are them. So, so step number one is talk to the people in the trenches working, uh, working in the schools. Um, as far as um, funding for that, I think the first, the first step is what we, what we can get from, from within the, the budget that, that were allocated from the, from the state. I think um, going, going to a bond measure uh, is an option, but it should be like a, a, a last ditch option because uh, of, the, of the long term commitment that it affects to us, our kids, and even our kids' kids. Thank you, Ami. 
Yeah, so, you know, I definitely, I realize that we need to invest a lot in our facilities and our schools definitely don't look the way that they rank. So as a community, what we need to do is we need to decide how we want to get there. How are we going to go ahead and start this process of fixing our facilities? This year, I think that we are very fortunate because we do have a surplus. So hopefully some of that money will go towards fixing our facilities. But again, as Jeremy mentioned, we also have to look at other approaches from within our community. What, um, you know, what viable solutions are there and what works for our community. And that includes looking at another bond measure or fundraising, whatever it is, there is something that's going to have to be done. Thank, Thank you. you. Linda. Two of our schools have no air conditioning at all, and three of our schools have air conditioners that are not working. And it was over 90 degrees the first couple weeks of school. I have taught in classrooms without air conditioning with four fans going, and I have shouted the entire time, and I'm talking to students who are lying with their faces red on their desk because they can't learn. So we absolutely positively need to improve that situation. Um, an additional, I happen to have show and tell. Um, this fell off of the balcony at Peninsula High School this week. It did not hit a child, uh, but large pieces of cement should not fall from the sky. So we need to do a major amount of facilities repair. Um, I do think the way to do that is going to take a large amount of money, and I do think that that involves getting the community behind us. And since most of the community is older than I am and doesn't have children in the schools, we're going to have to reach out to them and make sure they're informed of why the schools need this amount of money. Thank you. Matt? <clears throat> Thank you. So we formed a uh, facility advisory committee to actually look into what our district needs. So that is a board appointed committee full of members of the community and staff who get together and look at where our efforts should be placed for facilities. Air conditioning, definitely one of them. And, you know, we uh, unfortunately, our electrical system cannot handle air conditioning at some of our schools because they were built back in the 60s. So really, it's looking at what we need to do in order to finance that. Um, you know, a bond. It, our district does not receive much money from the state, and they, the state expects districts to use bonds to improve facilities. Uh, we failed with our last bond effort. I think we went too large and didn't communicate it as well as we should have. Um, but it's something that we're definitely going to have to look at again if we truly want to improve the quality of our schools' facilities. Jenny, thank you, Matt. I know our facilities are not in the best of shape, and I think we would definitely need to talk to the students and the teachers because they're there every day from eight to three-ish in, in the middle of, of everything. And as Linda noted, concrete should not be falling from the sky. If you were to ask my children, the problem is the bathrooms. All through kindergarten, uh, Audrey would not use the bathroom. She went to the health office. That's, that's a problem. Um, I would love to see, given that we have a surplus, going through the budget, line by line by line to see where can we make some actual capital investments in our facilities. Now, whether that's the bathrooms at Montemalaga Elementary or fixing the falling concrete at you know, Peninsula High, the board will have to figure that out with input, obviously, from the teachers and the rest of the community. Thank you. Thank you. Aaron? Yeah, facilities I've heard have, they are all 50, 60 years old. They need improvement. Plus, new stuff needs to be put in. It's, it's not like keep building the old facilities and, and you can keep that going forever. Uh, what I think may be missing is, a, as Jenny mentioned, a top-down plan to look at facilities and prioritize them in the, in the spirit of, the, well, we're getting uh, quite a bit of surplus from the state. The state is increasing our funding, and that's a good chance for us to look at facilities and improve them systematically. I'm not opposed to a bond measure if it's done correctly, if it's communicated to the community and uh, the needs are there. Air conditioning, for example, bathrooms, those are pretty fundamental needs, don't you think? So I'm not opposed to having a bond measure to support that. But the communication has to be clear. Thank you. Yeah. Sarah. Uh, as a parent of two kids in the district, I was really disappointed when Measure PV didn't pass. But I agree there were critical problems with the organization and the communication around the effort. I happened to serve on the facilities committee this year, and so I learned that our seismic, a lot of our buildings are in dire need of seismic retrofit. Our HVAC is not serviceable in a lot of our school sites, and there's pavement problems. I also learned that there are state buckets of money that the district has never tapped into. So for example, there's a seismic mitigation 
Innovation Program, where the state helps districts fund seismic retrofits of buildings, sometimes even offsetting completely the district's uh, matching funds. And we had never applied for that program until this year. So I think before going to a bond measure, which I always support funding schools, we have to tap out any state or federal pools of money before going to voters. Thank you. Julie? Um, our facilities are crumbling. All of them are rated fair. Um, we are talking about having a surplus, but we haven't allocated funds to replace our crumbling facilities. So I'm not sure if we could call that a surplus. We don't even have a capital improvements budget, which is really scary to me. And that needs to happen. That's item number one. When I ask the district, the response I get is that we have to pass a bond in order to uh, improve our facilities. Our demographics don't support the passage of a bond here. I don't think it's going to happen. And we shouldn't be asking our residents to pay more taxes. A big part of why it's so expensive to repair and improve facilities is due to asinine state laws and policies. We need to get creative. I think we need to look at a facilities endowment. We need to look at corporate sponsorship. We need to look at using some of the surplus seconds. money. Um, we can't keep trying to pass a bond. I think it's lazy, it's expensive, and it's unpopular. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, Jean. So as I said, three of our kids graduate from a peninsula, and I've seen the crumbling stairwells. It's very scary. Um, one of the things that PTA does at council level is support the legislative program for teaching our kids to advocate. And when our high schoolers had the opportunity to advocate for something, guess what they advocated for? Bathroom improvement. This is... We're, you know, it put, it broke my heart because we're this school and they're asking for improvement of our bathrooms. But as a result, because of them, we got half a million dollars. So I think, think out of the box. I love what Sara said, tap into these funds that are available. If not us, I mean, we'd lose out if we don't tap into that. I never like to vote for taxes because we have three in college and three more on the way. But um, if it means that we bring something to our kids and their livelihood and safety, and if it's done reasonably, I understand the facilities committee. I saw their plan. It looks really good. We brought people on that opposed it, and uh, now they're on you. it. Thank you. Oh, thank I'm you. Sorry. sorry about that. Um, Anyway, we've got about 25 minutes of questions left and 20 minutes of closing statements. Would everyone stand up and just stretch for a second? You might want to <laughs> just move around, get the blood flowing again so we don't lose anybody. And while you all are moving around, candidates, well, I'll wait, I'll wait. Yeah, we're only doing this for about 15 seconds, so move it out, shake it out. <laughs> All right, let's try and go ahead. Hello? Hello, hello, hello. Let's go ahead and take our seats, please. Ladies and gentlemen, take seats, please. Thank you. And while we're taking our seats, I want to just throw a follow-up question to the candidates because several of you touched on this. You talked about the infrastructure bond in 2019. So think carefully if you want to go on record saying whether or not you supported that and would you support a new bond initiative in the future. So did you support and would you support? And let's go ahead and start with Ami. Sure, this is such an important question. And as Julie mentioned, I know that it's kind of a hot button issue for our community. Um, one of the things is, you know, we have to look at our facilities and we have failing facilities and that's something that we are going to have to address. Um, you know, it, it's a tricky solution, but if we were to pass another bond, I think we need to um, be specific about what we're going to do and how we're going to use that money. So that's the first step. And the second part is we need community involvement. Um, one of the suggestions um, that I heard that I thought was great is that our facilities should be community um, rec centers. So if community members who don't have kids in the district wanted to come in, for example, and go swimming, they would be able to use the facilities in that way. So Ami, then, I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut you off, but I, I had a specific question. I'm, did you support and would you support? We could almost go yes, no, and I didn't mean to cut you off, but that's really what I think people are interested in. Okay. Um, 
Yes, I supported the bond, and yes, I would support another one with the things that I indicated. Perfect. That it, it would be more specific. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate that. Linda. Yes, and yes, and we should tap into every other dollar we can find as well. Thank you. Matt? Yes, and yes, and I do want to talk just briefly about the buckets. We had to have matching funds, and the district simply didn't have matching funds to go after that money, and that's why we didn't. But we knew it was there. We want it, and now maybe we can go after that money. Okay. Uh, Jenny. Yes, I supported the bond measure, and yes, I would support it again, provided with the caveats that we have the money specifically, we know exactly where it's going to go and what it's going to be spent on. Thank you. Aaron. No, I did not support the, the, the bond because I did a lot of research on what the bond was all about. It was a communication issue. It was a branding issue. The bond was put forward to improve the safety of the facilities. However, there was one new performing arts centers, two swimming pools, astroturf for all the fields, and $58 million worth of air conditioning. I agree that they could be required, but the fact that the bond was advertised as a safety bond, that didn't sit well with me. So it was a communication issue, not, not that those things are not required. And a future bond? Yes. Thank you. Sarah? Is it mic on? Thank you. Um, yeah, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank um, you for that. Serving on the committee, I attended the meeting with district leadership with the Office of Public School Construction, and our district had never actually applied for that program. Um, and in fact, um, Brenna, Tur Brenna did ask about waiving the matching funds because we have done that in the past for other projects and we were told that we could apply for the waiver. So hopefully now we are going through that process with that uh, structural assessment and working on applying for that program, hopefully. I hope we get it. <laughs> Okay, so um, that I did vote yes and support uh, Measure PV. I encouraged all my friends to do so. I would, again, support a bond measure. Again, if we've tapped out on every other bucket of money that's available and we've communicated it well. Perfect. Thank you. Julie. Thank you so much. Um, no, I did not support Measure PV. It was almost $400 million bond. It wasn't specific enough, and I didn't trust that it would be appropriately utilized. And no, I would not support a new measure. I know that's unpopular. I'll probably be the only person up here that says that. I don't think the demographics in our community support it. And I think we need to be more creative. We pay a lot in taxes here, and there's no reason we should have crumbling facilities. We don't need to add additional taxes onto our community. Thank you. Uh, Jean. Yes, I did. I walked through Penn and things are crumbling. The ceiling was moldy, so I did. I jumped in. However, um, thinking about that, maybe it was just naive, but I just expected, I didn't do due diligence at the time. I was a little bit naive about that. But if there were a second bond, I would also support it. If it had oversight, it had specific quantity measured, things accomplished, and more money so that we don't give it an all one lump sum. So I do support it. Thank you. Thank you. And Jeremy? One of the, the buzz phrases in the military is being good stewards of taxpayer money. Don't be, don't be wasteful. I know we would love to say there's no price that's too high to pay for our kids, but the reality of the situation is, is, is that there is because that, that, that debt is, affects them and maybe even their kids. So no, I did not support uh, the, the, the Measure PV um, because I felt like it was an irresponsible use of the money uh, and misallocated. Yes, I would support a future bond if it, if it is, uh, meets my standards of, uh, of being good stewards of taxpayer money. Thank you. Next question for Linda. What is your position on CRT, critical race theory? Give me the hot topic, huh? Start them off. Um, currently, there is an ethnic studies class taught at the high schools in response to some racially insensitive happenings that occurred several years ago. It is a pilot program that was a proactive response at the recommendation of past students. Currently, students choose to take this class. Parents are not required to put their child in the class. The class currently discusses the contributions and experiences of Native American, African American, Latino American, and Asian American students. 
The teachers of this course last year said that for the first time, students came to her and said that they saw themselves in history and realized the contributions that people like them had made. So for those people, that class should be there. Um, it is not required, it's an option, and again, parents have the right and should have the right to choose whether their child takes the course. Thank you. Matt. Uh, so the law will be that we do have to have an ethnic studies course in a few years. And what we did as a board was we started an elective course so that we could work on the curriculum and develop it in a manner that was best reflective of our community and what our community wanted. And one of the things I've always said is that I will not support a curriculum that makes a child feel bad about how they were born. And no student should ever be made to feel less than simply because of how they were born. And at the same time, we need to celebrate the fact that we are all different. The fact that we are different is what makes society so great. If we were all the same, life would be very, very boring. Thank you. Jenny? To echo Matt's sentiment, I don't support um, any kind of course or study that makes any child feel less than 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 less than good about themselves because of the color of their skin, because of their gender, or or anything else. Um, I don't think that's right. I don't believe in a in a in any sort of education that that teaches and advocates for victimhood. That somehow just because of the color of your skin, the world is against you. I would never teach my children that. Um, I don't I don't teach them. Oh, well, you're Jewish, so people aren't going to like you. Or you know, you're a girl, so life is going to be harder. No, you need to rise to the occasion. On the other side of that, I 100% believe in supporting and talking about what makes us wonderful, what makes us different. America's a melting pot. Every year I go in and talk about Hanukkah at the elementary school so that we can have an idea of where we come from and everyone can learn and share um, you know, their different upbringings and their heritages. That's what I think is important. Thank you. Thank you. Aaron. Um, based on my understanding, CRT is more like an assumption that the system is broken and we need to fix it. I believe that some of our laws and policies and so on are racially uh, motivated, and I believe in fixing them individually, continuously improving on our uh, diversity, views of diversity, that everybody's equal. But I don't believe that the system is broken and we should indoctrinate our children uh, to, to that. I'm glad that it's an, it's an optional class and not a required class. I prefer that we teach history and facts. I prefer that we teach critical thinking and not critical race theory. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sara? Critical race theory is not taught in K-12 schools, and there is no proposal to teach CRT in schools. Thank you. We, we are now offering an ethnic studies course, and let me share that. Uh, my daughter participated in a project at Cornerstone where she had to reenact immigration through Ellis Island as an Irish person. She learned the conditions that the Irish people endured and what their early immigration experience was like. All the ethnic studies course attempts to do is to broaden the number of stories we share so we get to understand why did maybe the Japanese people come to this country? What were their early experiences like? What is their perspective in the country? Why did the Chinese arrive? How were indigenous people impacted? by the change in borders, because borders did change over time. Um, and so I think it's a beautiful thing to teach our children about the very diverse community we live in so we can interact with one another in a positive manner. Thank you. Thank you. Julie. Thank you so much. So CRT is obviously a hot button issue, and it depends on how you define it. Um, I believe that all of our kids should be taught respect, love, and empathy but they shouldn't be taught that they're born victims or oppressors or that they should pay a price for something terrible that their ancestors did. Um, I have a dear friend who shared with me for the first time after the George Floyd incident that every time he gets in the car, he has to put his registration and license in an organized folder because he's been pulled over so many times and it's he faces danger as a very dark-skinned black man. And I think it's important for people to hear these stories understand other people's experiences and have empathy and learn to be better, but we shouldn't be teaching little kids that they rank on a hierarchy of victimhood, that they're victims or oppressors. I think we need to teach them empathy, kindness, and love, and that's what my kids' teachers are already doing. Thank, Thank you, you, Julie. Thank you. Uh, Jean. 
I'm for anything that unites us. This is a very divisive topic. Um, we started Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Committee under the leadership of Beth Meyerhoff at Peninsula High School. My philosophy to my board was we celebrate diversity, but we build on common ground. And that's what we need to do. We're Americans. We all came here. Our, our, our ancestors came here for a reason. And there are values in, in place that we can all celebrate, find a place for ourselves. So that's my perspective on CRT. Thank you. Jeremy? I love what Matt and, uh, and Jenny said about uh, not making someone feel bad for who they are. And I love what Sara said about uh, teaching the teaching the history of experiences of, of, of many different people going through there. Uh, and when when she says that CRT is not taught in K through 12, that is that is technically correct. But what worries me is the um, the implications of it being being implemented uh, through practice in that. And one example of that based on the uh, the origins of it, of the you know Marxist communist type things, that equality of outcome is more important than equality of opportunity. Uh, and I think that we should give all kids the opportunity to succeed uh, and recognize that uh, some may perform better than another, but then that's okay because everybody is different. Everybody has different skills and everyone has different advantages. Thank you, Ami. So I completely agree with what you said, Sara. And CRT is not a requirement in K through 12 schools in California, and therefore is not a part of our curriculum. And CRT is completely different than ethnic studies. Um, and when it comes to ethnic studies, my um, my viewpoint is very simple. I appreciate diversity, and I appreciate learning about other cultures and other people. And I think it's something that we should celebrate as a community. Thank you. Okay, we've got about 12 minutes before I was told to uh, pull the hook on this thing. But uh, anyway, I'm gonna maybe we could do a little speed questions here. Following up on that, uh, Matt, let's start with you. Are there any specific curriculum enhancements that you would encourage or recommend specifically? I, I would love to return our focus to math and English to get back to the core values and make sure that we are succeeding there. I'm very proud to say that our test scores in this district are up. The rest of the state, they went down. Our district actually went up because we did decide to put that focus path back on math and on English. The other subjects are very important, history being my favorite, but math, once you get behind in math, you never catch up. So making sure that all of our students are proficient in math. Thank you. Jenny. As a parent of a seventh grader, a curriculum enhancement I would love to see, and I know the district is currently working on now, is a writing program. Um, the two years of the pandemic, my son effectively never learned how to write an essay, put together a book report, have any sort of, of actual skill set to put together a speech or anything else. And I would love to see this writing program that I know the district is talking about implemented as, as early as possible. And so hopefully my son will catch up before he gets to high school. But I think that is something that the district needs to focus on after the pandemic because you can't, it's very difficult to teach writing um, over Zoom when your teacher can't be there and providing feedback in real time. Thank you. Thank you. Aaron? Yeah, I agree with Matt that we have to pay attention to the basics, reading, math, and so on. Today I saw some pre uh, dramatic statistics about eighth grade enrollment in algebra has dropped tremendously in the school district. And that's an issue because if you don't know how to do math, you cannot do a lot of the other things that they teach in college. So math is it's exactly, extremely important and so are reading skills. So I think we need to really pay attention to the basics of what we're teaching our kids and reinforce it to, to get them to understand the importance of it. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah? It's really hard to write and learn if you cannot read. 20% of Californians now are dyslexic. One out of every five kids struggles with learning to read. It does not come naturally. In 2018, our district adopted the Wonders Curriculum, which is a balanced literacy program. It does not rely as heavily on phonemic awareness and phonics, whereas a structured literacy program does. We do have the structured literacy program for our special needs students. It's called Sande. Um, I wish we could help the teachers uh, screen students in K through two and identify the students that need extra 
Braille learning, uh, extra reading assistance so they can be pulled out and receive access to that Sunday structured literacy program. Um, it'll also reduce, reduce the burden on our special needs program a little bit as well if these kids get the reading intervention they need early on. So that would be my top bucket, uh, top request right now. Thank you, Julie. Uh, music. Music has given me a lot. It is so enriching. Not all kids have an equal opportunity to learn an instrument or musical theory. And once you have those fundamentals, it's something that you can carry with you for the rest of your life. It's something for me that gives me joy and gives my life meaning. And it gives kids an outlet and a community. I was a kid that ate lunch in the band room. Those were my, my friends and my community. It's huge for mental health. So I would like to focus on music. Thank you. Jean? I agree with Matt and Aaron. We need to uh, go back to the essentials. Um, on top of that, I would like to see some life skills come back. Home ec, financial literacy is important as well. Um, thank you. Right, let's hold our applause, please. Thank you. Um, in addition, I'd like to equip our, our um, kids with some knowledge of um, mental health start early. There are courses I'm setting up with the nonprofit that I have, mentorship and career whatnot. There's life maps we can equip our kids with so they can have a self check-in, 30 seconds. Where am I in my life? Am I um, needing more community? Am I, am I missing my goal here? So those are some life skills that I think that they um, could be equipped with. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Jeremy. So the second com uh, committee that I want to form is the Academic Review Committee, uh, uh, both an internal and an external review of best practices among our schools as well as neighboring communities. Uh, because some of the numbers that I've seen, in addition to what Aaron mentioned about the uh, eighth grade algebra, uh, some of the standardized testing scores have, have actually dipped a little bit. Uh, in 2019, for example, uh, nearly one out of three 11th graders did not meet the college standard uh, for math, and that's, that's, that's worrisome to me. So I think we need to have a little bit more of a refocus on, uh, on core competencies of, uh, of, of math and reading um, before we, before, because those are like the primary responsibility of, 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 the, of students to, to, to be able to survive in, in, the, in the world uh, before they can start thinking about uh, extra things. Uh, but again, I am, not a, uh, I am not a teacher, I'm not an academic expert, so I would rely on uh, talking to uh, all the experts, uh, principals, and, uh, and, and teachers in all the schools to, to inform that decision. Thank you, Ami. So um, I believe everybody has covered the subjects that I would <laughs> want to see um, a curriculum enhancement on. So the first one is writing. And as Jenny had mentioned, during the COVID years, um, kids did not get to um, write as much as they needed to, especially the younger elementary age students. So this year, the district is rolling out a writing program for all ages, I mean, for all grades across the district. And I'm really looking forward to seeing how that is because our kids do need the extra practice with writing. Um, the other one that I am really interested in is science. And, you know, we have a new science curriculum that just started where it's more hands-on. And I'm very curious to see how that goes because it's very different to read science in a textbook versus experience it hands-on. So um, those would be my two. Thank you. Thank you. Linda. I'm glad to hear that math is a priority, although I think we're already making great strides in that direction. Um, I would look to what some of our neighboring districts are doing. And for example, Torrance has a career technical education program where <coughs> students get extra in-depth exploration of careers they're interested in and they get a seal at graduation. There are programs in arts, media, and entertainment, engineering and architecture, health science and medical technology, information and communication technologies, and last year alone, Torrance received a million dollars in grant money. They also have a dual enrollment program with El Camino, which allows students to take both high school and college credit for some upper, receive both high school and college credit for some upper level courses. courses. Thank you. Thank you. And this will likely be our last question. So we are on to Jenny. Setting aside infrastructure, what are your biggest concerns with respect to the district's budget and do you believe that teachers and administration are appropriately compensated? There you go. Sorry. 
Um, so setting aside facilities, what do I think we should be spending our, our money on? That was the question, correct? And are, are teachers being appropriately compensated? I believe that we have the best teachers in this district. I love all of my, my sons and my daughter's teachers. I can, I can name every single one of them. Um, and I'm sure that they deserve more. I know we've always been financially constrained given what our base grant money is. I would love the district to be able to pay the teachers more or up their benefits. I have not, I'm not on the board. I haven't had an opportunity to dig into the budget and see where that is, but I'm absolutely would love to see us um, compensate our teachers more because I'm sure that they deserve it. Outside of that, what would I like to see outside of facilities? I would actually like to see us reinvest in our arts program. My son, or the booster club pays for the jazz, the jazz ensemble at um, PVIS. He loves music. He is a kid like Julie who eats in the band room most of the time at lunch. And thank you, Jenny. Thank you. Sorry. Appreciate it. Aaron? Yeah, it's a matter of squeezing the uh, the balloon, right? So the budget, you only have so much. You have to decide where to spend spend the money. So the facilities is is a big is a big deal. Uh, the retirement uh, liability sucks up a lot of interest. That's a big deal. And I also heard that the teachers in general in PV are underpaid compared to other districts. I think most people would agree with that. So it's just a matter for us to put the budget, all the line items down, and systematically go through and, 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 and understand where we need to put our biggest bang, where do we get the biggest bang for the buck? It's not about slighting one side or the other side. It's about, hey, this is all we got. This is all we have to spend. Thank you. Thank you. Sara. Uh, as has been mentioned, I don't think there's anything more impactful on a child's education or success than a really good teacher. Um, so I think the place I would want to put dollars, if, if they were available, would be in professional development for teachers and, and administration and school board members, actually. I'd love to see teachers have more support and training on how to support IEPs in their classroom. I think teachers really want to help support mental health of students, but it's outside their expertise. So perhaps some training on uh, recognizing signs of distress in a student. Uh, bullying, understanding what teachers can do to help mitigate bullying on campus. Um, I also think teachers are have really been through a lot during this pandemic. So offering them some support, professional development on how to take care of their own mental health is probably really important as well. Thank you. Julie? <clears throat> um, and I agree with Zara. Um, I think we've all been traumatized, teachers especially, with all of what happened during COVID. Uh, facilities aside, we can't do that because we've been doing that. That, and that's how we got into this position of having crumbling facilities and no money to spend aside from passing a bond. Um, but getting back to teachers and admin and whether they're appropriately compensated, teachers are incredible. They are saints, angels on earth. Any principal that is still working now after enduring COVID over the last two years is uh, a much better human being than I am. The problem is adding to compensation um, is the long-term obligation. So the pension contributions are huge. And that's something that we need to consider and educate the public on. You know, these, they're making six-figure pensions that we have to consider whenever we add to the compensation packages. And we compare to other districts that might be paying more, we have to see if those districts are have a good long-term financial position, if they're issuing pink slips, or um, if they're comparable Thank you. to what PV is doing. Thank you, Julie. Jean. So I believe that we need um, our teachers. It's the first point of contact for our kids, right? We talked about that for mental health and everything uh, for, for their benefit. So for what was troubling was we have such a shortage of teachers. Our principals were subbing, um, and that's not that's not right. We we don't have enough teachers. I think we need to double down and recruit some more teachers so that their classrooms are our teachers' classrooms are not over full. Um, at the same time, I think we could look for other ways um, of supplementing. For example, PEF has a program now that is um, sponsoring music and art programs before and after. Suzanne Seymour is running that. In addition, we have a wealth of parents here who can volunteer and, and potentially supplement education with the extracurricular. We have retired musicians. We have retired professors. I think it takes the whole community. Thank you, Jean. Jeremy. We have a great school district uh, in large part because of the, the great teachers here. Um, 
I, uh, I spoke to my neighbor, Kelly Johnson, former, um, former principal of, uh, of Peninsula High School, and he really instilled within me that you support students by supporting teachers. So how do we attract and retain the best teachers to maintain the, the, the high status of our, of our schools is, is an important uh, topic. Um, I had a great conversation a couple weeks ago with, with uh, Tim Coleman, um, and one of the things he talked about was was just like the the medical benefits of of uh, of, of the teachers. You know, if here at, uh, in, on the hill, uh, a teacher going to see a doctor pays uh, could could pay could pay several hundred dollars or, or even thousands of dollars uh, compared to uh, compared to a, a teacher down in Redondo Beach uh, that that may only pay uh, less than a hundred dollars. And that's maybe that's a way that we can we can work it out to make make the uh, the willingness and the and the the desire to come and work uh, at uh, at PV Peninsula to attract and retain the best. Thank you, Ami. Um, outside of our facilities, I think the two most important things are um, using our. Um, our money to pay for uh, programs for our students and for our teachers. And um, really paying our teachers is one of the best things we could do because that brings in the best teachers into the district, which impacts our children. And in addition to that, paying for additional programs for our students, such as additional funds going to the gate program or the music program, which would just enhance the educational experience. Thank you, Linda. There is currently a nationwide teacher shortage. So if we want good teachers and administrators here, we need to, to work on retaining them. Um, if we expect to be in the top 25% of school districts nationwide, we need to pay our teachers in that same ballpark. Um, and I think we also could pay teachers extra if we want them to do activities at lunch because teachers are entitled to a duty-free lunch. And if we're looking at ways to find a time for students to get connected in groups, I saw that Peninsula High is starting an art program at lunch, and I don't know who's funding that, but I assume that that allows kids to wander in at lunchtime who might otherwise be eating lunch by themselves. So we could pay extra for teachers to give up their duty-free lunches to provide extra services for students. Thank you. Matt? I am happy this is a problem that we have. I haven't even decided how we spend this money because it has been where we haven't had money to spend. And I believe that ongoing increases, the money that we're going to get year after year is money that we should be putting towards salary, staff, and programs that are ongoing. And our one-time money should be looking at going to capital improvements and to improvements that will have a long-term benefit for our district. I agree our teachers deserve more money. And they are that point of contact, as you guys have said, and they are critical to the success of our students. And we just need to make sure that there are a lot of things out there that we want to do. Gate, transition to independence, music, art. There are so many wonderful programs that we want to be able to provide for our students that we need to make sure that we are addressing what's going to give each one of our students the best chance to succeed. Thank you. And uh, now we're at the part of the program where we're going to hear closing comments. But before we do that, let's give all these candidates a round of applause, please. You, you can take a deep breath for a second, but you all did a great job. And I feel very honored because you keep looking at me answering the questions and I keep nodding my head. So anyway, that, that was terrific. So each candidate is going to get two minutes for a closing statement, and we're gonna go reverse order. Matt, you're number one on the hit parade. There you go. Well, uh, first, of course, I'd like to thank the Palos First Peninsula Chamber of Commerce for putting this together. Eileen, thank you so much. And I am so impressed by the candidates up here, and I hope that I get elected and have an opportunity to work with you, because you are all wonderful. Your ideas are spot on. You are bringing passion and joy to this. And uh, I truly hope I have the opportunity to work with, with any of you. And I wish it could have been all of you. And so as we're closing out the, the evening, it is so important just that we look towards the future of our students. And uh, you know, Ms. Kurt, I agree with you. you know, we have to look at our career technical education. You know, As president of SCROC, that is a very important aspect is our students who want to go into vocation rather than college. And as a district, we cannot expect to have cookie cutter children. We want each child to be unique and to cater to their strengths and aid their weaknesses. 
I'm not going to use a full two minutes. That's all I have. Thank you. That's fine. Thank you. Applause if you'd like, ladies and gentlemen. All right, Linda. PV is a phenomenal district to raise children in, to live in, and to work in. But I remember not so long ago when students moved here from all over the world. I had students from India, I had students from China, I had students from Japan, not to mention across the country. And they came here for our math programs, they came here for our tennis team, they came for our speech and debate, and we want those kids to come again. And we also owe it to our current students to do everything we can to give them every possibility. So we need to enhance our academic offerings, we need to provide our students additional support, and we need to provide safe and modern facilities. I believe I am the most qualified candidate. All the candidates are parents, but many are the parents of young children, and they don't yet know the issues of raising a child or teaching a child through middle and high school. Additionally, I am a teacher. Many school districts have a teacher on their board. Until recently, Palos Verdes also had a teacher on the board, and she moved out of the district. With my 40 years of teaching experience, I can advise is it likely to work? Is there a better way? Have we tried this before? And in doing so, I could save the district time and money. I want to serve on the Palos Verdes Peninsula Unified School District School Board. I want to bring my years of experience as a parent and as an educator. I want to continue improving the educational experiences. If I'm elected, this will be my full-time occupation. I have no small children at home and no employer telling me what I need to do. I will visit each school site at least once during the year. I will make myself available to meet with the community frequently. I will learn what is going well, what concerns should be addressed, and I will work tirelessly to find solutions. I am ready to listen, ready to learn, and ready to serve. Again, I hope you will visit Linda Kurt for pvpusd.com to learn more about me and how you can help me. Together, we can continue to improve our school district and put students first. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, I want to take a minute to reflect back to the time that I've spent serving on the school board. I'm proud to be a resident of Palos Verdes and even more proud to be a member for, uh, for the school board for PVP USD. I bring experience and have provided a unique perspective as a mother of two students currently in the district. As an important an important priority of all board members is to be able to reach consensus and work together. I have demonstrated over the course of my tenure that I could do exactly that. I have always focused on doing what is right and listening to all our community members. In the end, I lead with the goal of what is right for our children. Our kids have one opportunity at a strong educational experience, and there are many aspects we need to focus on to reach that goal. So let's keep this conversation to what's most relevant to maintaining the academic excellence for which our schools are known for, to continue with the social and emotional well-being of our students and to continue the focus on mental health, and to make sure that we're spending money responsibly so that we can continue to support our students. Lastly, let's celebrate our successes. We are part of an amazing school district. Our students have accomplished so much. Our test scores are up. Our enrollment is up. Our students get into some of the best colleges nationally. And guess what? Because we have a surplus this year, we have the ability to spend more money on our students where it matters the most. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Jeremy? When it comes down to it, uh, PV schools are still some of the best in the country, uh, but resting on our laurels uh, can result in that status declining over time. Uh, it takes constant work to maintain our school's performance, uh, and I believe we can benefit from a, from a critical objective assessment across several facets uh, of, of our district to determine how we can keep our kids safe at school, raise academic standards, use taxpayer money more efficiently, increase parent involvement, and continue to attract the best teachers. Uh, one of the things that's contributed to the success of teams that I've led in the past was my ability to identify and, uh, and tap into the common motivation among all the various stakeholders uh, on the school board. That's, that's the easy part. Uh, everybody here wants what's best for the, for the kids in our district. Um, and it's especially true for those of us with, uh, with school-age kids uh, or, or are about to start school. Uh, regardless of who among us wins this election, I, I'm really actually op very optimistic about the future. Just like Matt said, everybody here is, uh, uh, is exceptionally qualified uh, and motivated to serve. Uh, so I'm, I'm really confident that whoever gets elected, uh, PV really can't lose uh, with any of us sitting on the board. 
Um, that said, I'm asking for your vote <laughs> because I believe that my experience and passion uh, make me the ideal uh, school board candidate uh, to build consensus, resolve conflicts, and objectively considered all opinions uh, and keep us goal oriented. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, but what I'm really excited actually is to hear from, from all of you. I'm going to be outside there. Uh, come up and chat with me uh, at any point or if you need to get home. Um, Check out my website, vanderhall4pv.com, uh, or you can email me at jeremy at vanderhall4pv.com. Uh, I, I really would love to hear from you, uh, even if it's just an email or a phone call, or if you want to meet for coffee anywhere, just let me know, uh, and I will, I will be there. Thank you. Thank you. Jean? In case you couldn't tell, I'm not a very good public speaker, but I'm a better doer. Um, I, I talking about myself and my opinions is an uncomfortable thing, but I like to listen to other people a lot. And because of that, um, our PTA gave $150 to teacher starter funds. We also created different projects to bring parents together. I'd like to continue that on the board. And as I said in the beginning, make these programs wider and more available to all of our schools. Um, the other thing I like to do. So you mentioned the art program at lunch. That's actually me. That was my idea. Well, what we did was we listened. I listened to parents and I respond. So one of the things that we created was a disability subcommittee. We listened to the kids. One of the moms said, my daughter loves um, bowling. Well, we don't have a bowling alley, but we could do bocce. So we did bocce ball at lunch. And now the gen ed and the special ed kids are together at lunch on Thursdays. I wanted to create that for art. Art and PTA is just a one-time reflections. I want that to be school like all year long. And I think that's good break for our children for mental health break as well. So I, I and that would again promote um, um, inclusion of all our kids. I think outside of the box, I'm solutions oriented. I'm also um, collaborative and I, and I respond. Um, I think that's all I have to say. Please come talk to me. Oh, yes. Thank you, Linda. You reminded me. Please visit jeanforpv.com. Come talk to me individually and much better one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and um, thank you very much. I'd like to have your vote so I can serve on a bigger platform. And as I have more time, I will just share that I'm on the board of other children's youth-oriented um, organizations. I've had my feet on the ground, and I'm committed into investing in our kids and the next generation who will be our leaders. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. <laughs> Julie. Right. Um, the fact that we have this many people running for school board demonstrates the need and appetite for change in our community. I think things are certainly improving now that our schools are fully open and the state has injected billions of dollars into public schools just before the election. Um, but people are upset and angry and many still feel unheard, myself included. That's why I'm here. Um, many children are still healing from the trauma of the last few years, but many are suffering in silence and we need accountability for what we stole from them over the last few years. And they deserve a promise from us that we will never keep them from their friends, from their schools, from their activities ever again. And they need to be able to rely on us and look forward to the future with hope. Um, they need stability and I promise to give them that. And that's why I'm here and not with you because I wanted my kids to be able to rely on this vacation, I promise them. Um, and it's a superpower, not a weakness to be a mother of young children because I am very in tune with their needs and I'm extremely invested in fighting for what's best for them. I have the legal and political experience to lead the, the district in the right direction, to shield us from the nonsense coming from the state of California um, I have a zero tolerance policy for nonsense. Um, I'm honored to serve as the planning commission chair for the city of Rancho Palos Verdes. I'm a former traffic safety committee member. I've received an award for outstanding performance of official duties from the national security division of the United States Department of Justice. Um, I'm a community leader with common sense and I can help restore greatness to our community and to our schools. I'll never stop fighting for our Kids, and I am willing to stand alone to put our kids' interests as our district's top priority. Um, please, I do want to meet you if I haven't already. Reach out, www.hamel4pv.com. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah. 
Thank you, Chamber of Commerce, for organizing this elegant forum and for everyone who came out on a weeknight. My kid is gonna hate this, but I have to thank my ninth grader who's out here despite boatloads of homework. So thank you, <laughs> sweetheart, for being here and putting up with this. Um, it really is an honor to run alongside so many people who are so deeply passionate about our school. Uh, I'm, of course, first a resident and a parent, so I'm grateful to have so many choices. Um, I did step away from practicing dentistry to work with youth. It started out because I cared about my own kids, and gradually I started falling in love with other people's kids. My kids are convinced I love other people's kids more than I love my own. And I quickly realized that, you know, our kids are having a hard time with their wellness, and they're feeling disconnected from community members, and they were spending a lot of time at school, and that was the place to start. And that's why I really wanted to get involved with our schools first. I may not be an expert expert on every school board matter, matter, but I'm committed to learn. I'm committed to showing up to listen unconditionally to everyone who cares about our schools. I'm committed to having a positive collaborative relationship with our teachers all the time, not just during elections. I'm committed to talking to parents, be, have, being open with them, open line of communication at all three levels of schools. I also think it's important for a board member to be engaged with the community that don't have children because they are stakeholders in the community. I'm committed to pushing my to work towards consensus and mutual understanding on the board, even though it's really hard at times, and across the entire district community. I'm committed because my family is incredibly grateful for our public education. I'm committed because I believe that every kid matters as much as my own, because I hope kids are going to hate this again, but I really hope that this is the community that my grandchildren will grow up in one day. So I would be thrilled and honored to earn your support and vote in November's school board election. I will also linger outside, and you can learn more about me at www.drsaradean.com. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Aaron. Well, thank you, uh, Chamber's Commons, for organizing this. This is a very, very elite group of people that, with lots of crea creative ideas and diversity. So when I told my wife I was going to run for a school board, she thought I was crazy. <laughs> and she asked me why. And I said, I'm doing it for the money. So, <laughs> uh, so um, I think I offer some very unique skills and experience to the school district, which I think uh, lacking. Uh, for example, you know, the, everybody says good things about, okay, I'm going to do f something for the kids, education. Nobody's going to say, I'm going to mess up the kids. You know, who, who would say that in, a, in an election campaign, right? But I think the, the difficulty is to turn those ideals and turn those passions into reality. I think that's where I come in, because I ran factories before. I've delivered nuclear power plant up in the San Luis Obispo. That was my power plant, uh, you know, 40 years ago. So I have the expertise to turn um, passion into reality. And that's what I bring to the party. For example, if you were talking about the budget, I would, if I'm on the board, I would put a balanced budget policy in place. So we can go and spend money that we don't have, which we have done in the, nine, in the last past nine of the 12 years. I would put some quantifiable measures in place. I would be transparent. I would issue my own quarterly report to you these are my promises that I made to you when I am running for election. Do I meet them or not? If I didn't meet them, fire me. I'm okay with that. So that's the kind of brass tech approach I would take to solving problems. And I know it's a lot of uh, good talking out there, but I think I urge you to drill down, look at facts, go to my website. I'm going to be outside. But think about it in this two or four minutes place uh, time frame. How do you decide who's the right candidate? You got to drill deep, deep. Thank you. Thank you. And again, last but not least, Jenny. Yes, we saved the best for last. Yeah. OK. I want to say thank you again for the Chamber of Commerce for putting together this event tonight. It's really been lovely. I was very nervous, but I'm feeling you know, a little better now. Um, and I'm so glad we were able to come together and share ideas. Uh, we've discussed so many topics tonight. We had academic excellence, mental health, facilities, safety, volunteerism, fiscal responsibility. And it's nice to know that several of us have similar goals for the district because ultimately four of us will, will, will be together starting next year. So I think that's great. Um, I think we have to remember that being on the board requires leadership. 
Um, and a leader doesn't just sit back quietly, they speak up, they advocate, they motivate, they roll up their sleeves and they get their hands dirty when a job needs to be done. A leader coaches the team, she runs the PTA, she joins the superintendent advisory committee and then she runs for school board. A leader gets creative when the principal says, student council can't happen because of COVID. Or she fights back when the county tells her husband, who was a president of the Little League at the time, you can't open the snack shack during baseball. A leader doesn't take no for an answer. They stand up and push back and do what's right for the children and the community. I've done that for our community time and time again. And if you vote for me on November 8th, I promise always to put PV first, it's students, it's parents and it's teachers first always. So do me a favor, come talk to me afterwards. Check out votejennyforpv.com. And thanks, y'all. Thank you. Hold on one second, one second. I'd just like to personally say before I turn it back over to Eileen, thank you very much. You've been a great audience and it really is telling that you're all out here tonight to listen to these wonderful candidates. I would also especially like to thank our timekeepers. They did a great job. Yes. <laughs> Mr. 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 Zoom master over here, Frank, he did a great job too. And Eileen, it's 901. I kept my promise. All right, thank you. Big round of applause for these people. I just, I just want to thank Jerry Dehovic for his time. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for the candidates. Go talk to them. Have a good evening. Get home safely. Thank you so much.